Okay, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Arthi, um, and many of you know me already. <laughs> I've been leading uh, Methacits at um, Corsanga for a couple of years now. Um, and it's so nice to be doing my very first Dharma talk ever um, in, at Corsanga because it's such a soft landing for me. So I reside on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, which is colonially known as Vancouver. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for your time, your trust, your attention, and particularly your generosity, as I am very nervous. <laughs> um, and so there might be some foibles, um, and I know you're all going to be uh, cheering me on anyway. Okay. Um, so just a little note um, that I might be using some Buddhist terminology and you might not know what that is and that's totally fine. Um, so you can just ask in the chat or feel free to um, message True North Insight account privately if you want to and folks can help clarify if you don't know what's going on. Um, yeah, okay. So I planned this talk because I've been really annoyed with Instagram. And I promise this whole talk won't just be about my aversion to Instagram, but a little bit of it is going to be for sure. Um, and why it's been annoying for me is that um, it's just kind of full of these spiritual health and wellness gurus, right? Who offer so many suggestions on how to take care of ourselves. Um, it's a lot of, you know, do this, be this way, you know, those kinds of things. I think you know what I'm talking about, these like infographics, these like do and don't lists. It's kind of the Instagram way. So it can be things like, if you hack your nervous system, if you meditate more, if you eat your greens, and if you have a flat stomach, or, you know, if you learn these 35 emotional skills, then what? And that's the part that confuses me is there's a lot of ifs and then I don't know the what part is, what happens if we do all of these things. And I wonder if the what part is, you know, if I do all these things, then would I be more whole? Would I be happy? Would I be without suffering? Perhaps I'd be worthy of love. Perhaps I might belong. And so, you know, there's nothing wrong with eating lots of vegetables. Like, you know, you do you, it's great. Um, but sometimes it can create this, this perception of there's something wrong with me. There's something inside of me that needs to be fixed, right? So there can be, then there can be this guilt that shows up about not doing enough um, because I'm not, you know, like checking off my self-care list, my 100 items of things I must do in order to be good, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, and it can create this, um, this subtle aggression, sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle aggression towards the self that shows up in the self-improvement, self-languaging, right? I need to be better. So this perfectionism can be an aggression towards the self. So I'll tell you a story about how this showed up for me. Um, eight years ago, I went on my very first long retreat. So it was a, a long, silent retreat. It was six weeks. And I was like, cool, I'm going to just be the most intense meditator of any meditator that has ever lived. I'm just going to, I have all of this, um, I have all of this suffering and I'm just going to tackle it. Like something's going to show up in my system. I'm going to show up with awareness and bam, there it goes. You know, that was my attitude. And so, um, so I was like, cool, there's five hindrances. Day one doubt. I'm just going to like knock it out of the park. Day two aversion. I'm done with that. You know, I was like, I'm just going to have the best awareness ever. And yeah, that's not really how meditation works at the time. I didn't know that there are two wings to mindfulness. So wing one, which is, I was really quite good at at the time, was this wisdom practice where you shine the light of awareness on whatever is arising and you're, um, and you, and you meet it, right? You just meet, you, you meet whatever's happening. And wing two is compassion. And so the idea is that you meet whatever is arising with this kindness, with this friendliness, or what some people term kindfulness, right? 
that's not, that's not what I was doing on retreat. And at the time I didn't know very much about trauma. I mean, I knew a little bit, but not a lot. And I was experiencing these really heavy waves of um, sleepiness that was also spacey and kind of like calming, but then underneath it was pretty scary. And I didn't really understand that what I was experiencing is this freeze response. I actually thought I was just being lazy. And so that striving energy really showed up. If you're being lazy, you can beat this. You know, this is a hindrance, you can beat it. And so I tried to beat it with my sit. And I didn't just shine a little flashlight of awareness on it. I shot shone like the floodlights, these investigative, really harsh floodlights. And I remember getting up from that sit. Um, and not being able to figure out how to leave the meditation hall. I just couldn't figure it out. And then I started walking into walls and then 20 days had passed and I hadn't slept at all. And I was a disaster. My nervous system had totally imploded. So that's a pretty extreme example of striving, right? That's not most of our experiences. But I think we can notice our experiences of striving on the cushion, right? We might say things to ourselves like, you know, talk about if then, right? If I meditated for 45 minutes, three times a day, then maybe I would be better. Maybe I would feel okay. But that's not the real world. Most of us aren't gonna do that. And I think about how that striving energy shows up in the culture of Buddhism, right? So, you know, we have this strange hierarchy of like good ways to sit and bad ways to sit or good ways to meditate and bad ways to meditate, right? So it'll be like sitting is a better practice than standing and sit and sitting is better than walking. And like, if you can sit on a cushion and lotus position, you can just call yourself a Buddha, you know? Um, and that is definitely not what we learn from our teachers. And it's not what we learn from the, from the scriptures. And yet it's part of our culture. So we can just see the striving energy everywhere, you know? Okay. But the Buddha said that we all have seeds of enlightenment within us. We're inherently good. And all we, and part of what we need to do is garden, is, is to tend to the garden of our own goodness. The white supremacist, capitalist, ableist, fat phobic, classist, cis sexist, heteropatriarchy is pretty invested in these individualized notions of self-care, right? It's pretty, pretty on brand with Instagram. Um, and the idea is that we all just need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We just like need to get our greens in and have our bubble baths. And that's such a narrow goal of what wellness is, right? And it makes sense because if we're spending all of our time with this kind of fat phobic goal of like losing 10 pounds, first of all, that's likely not going to lead to any lasting happiness but we probably aren't going to be spending as much time questioning those systems, right? Um, or working towards abolishing them. So we're told a lot that we must work at ourselves to be worthy of love and belonging. And my question is, what if we already belong? What if we don't need to work so hard? And I'm not saying that um, agency isn't important, you know? Um, you know, eat your veggies if you want to. But what's important is really noticing the energy behind our actions, right? Is it like, is it that striving energy? Like I'm just thinking about what's it like to sit on the cushion? Is that energy, that kind of striving energy up here? Is it kind of a like relaxed kind of sleepy energy down here? Or is it that middle path that the Buddha very often talks about that being the path that we need to take, the middle path. Okay, so let's see how this is landing for you so far. We're going to do a really short sit together. So just take a minute to find your seat. Closing your eyes if you'd like to or having your gaze down. turning the attention inwards. And so I'm going to list three inquiries and I'd like for you to just see how they land in your body. So the first inquiry, what if I am fundamentally good?
what if there is nothing inherently wrong with me? What if I already belong? Just seeing where those land, if they land. So I'd like you to remember a time of striving in your life, something specific. So for example, Oh, I'd like you to choose something that's two or three on a spiciness scale of one to 10. So nothing too, too spicy, just still, just a little bit of zing, right? So for me, for example, that is, I have this, this striving energy around always cooking for myself and always, yeah, having lots of vegetables. So I'm remembering a specific moment of being on the couch exhausted, and yet there was a part of me that was like, you need to get up and cook. You're just finding your striving moment. And seeing what it feels like in the body as you're with it. Perhaps notice if any tension is arising or constriction. And if it's too big, just notice the outline of the tension. And now paying attention to the energy with which you are meeting the sensations in your body. Is it curious? Is it like, ah, okay, this is what constriction feels like? Or does it have like a subtle fix it energy, make it go away energy? I'm just noticing that. And we can pay attention to our hand, palm of our hand, perhaps turning it upwards. And setting the intention that our hand is there to hold any discomfort, to support that discomfort. And then placing the hand anywhere it needs to go on the body. Seeing if the places of discomfort can find some sense of belonging with the hand. Thanks everyone. Okay, so how do we tend to the garden of good within us? Um, so one of the things I don't like about the Instagram do's and don'ts list is that they're so unidirectional, right? It's someone on high telling us how to do, how to do things, how to be better. And they're not very relational, right? It's just the, the medium of that platform. 
And yet I think what we most need in order to see our own goodness is relationality. We need others to hold up a mirror so that we can see our own goodness. And it really makes a lot of sense to me that we struggle with seeing our own goodness. You know, our nervous systems have been designed to watch out for the tiger so that we don't get eaten, right? Really, really important that we're constantly kind of looking out for danger. And so it's also important that we look out for our own pro-social behavior and other people's pro-social behavior, but it's not as important as not getting eaten, right? So, so yeah, it completely makes sense that we are, we don't always look for the good. We don't always see the nurturing that's right there, but we can do this. Our brains, our nervous systems are plastic, they're moldable. And that's what our meditation practice does, right? It's shifting attention towards the wholesome. So we can do this formally on the cushion through our metta practice. But we can also do this by noticing the good in the world, right? So a couple of days ago, I was on the bus, like pretty standard everyday practice. And the bus driver was coming to a stop to, for people to get on, but did it at a really slow rate, like took an extra minute to slow down. And it's because they had seen that somebody was running along and was trying to get on the bus. And so there was a wave of compassion, right? That probably came over that person, the driver, and a wave of generosity to do that. And as that person jumped on the bus, there was somebody else in the front seat, in one of the front seats, who realized that that person was tired. And similarly, compassion, generosity, got up, moved, moved away so that person could sit down. Just everyday sangha, right? We were creating a bus sangha in that moment. There's so many moments of good, of belonging. Okay, so who else can hold a mirror of our goodness? Um, we also always and already belong to nature, right? Nature is such a beautiful mirror for us. And we are nature. The elements, the minerals that make up nature, these are the same elements, minerals that exist within us, right? So to go back to the anecdote about the retreat that I was on, the teachers decided that I would do better if I started meditating outside instead of inside. Okay, so they asked me to make sangha with the trees and the animals and the critters. And they asked me to find the principles of Dhamma through nature. And so a little background here, I am like, brown, obviously. I am also a, like a kid of refugees, grew up in Scarborough. If you know, you know what that means, you know. Um, but basically, I was like a real working class broke kid with like really stereotypical South Asian overbearing mom who was like, you're home at 3.30, you come home, there's no outside for you. And it's because for sure it's controlling and, and shitty. And also, it was because she was working a million jobs trying to like just keep us going, you know, and she was trying to make sure that I was just okay. So really beautiful, wholesome intention, you know, and then that would translate into not necessarily the most skillful actions, but still beautiful, wholesome intention. And so here I am, this, this person in my early 30s in nature, kind of for the first time, really, like, I mean, like 12 hours a day for the first, well, more like 18 hours a day for the first time, all day, every day. And I was supposed to find refuge here. That's what I was told to do, right? But I was kind of just terrified for the first little while. And then I started noticing, I just started noticing things. So I remember there was one day where it was just heavy, heavy rain and I had to be outside through it. And so I got to watch all of these little salamanders just like run under the leaves to get, to get some protection from the rain. And so I learned that just as I need to protect myself, so too do the salamanders. And same with the turtles who, would, who were on the log by the pond. As I would walk close to them, they would plop into the water because I could be a predator, right? And uh, 
this sapling. There was this really big boulder and a sapling was growing under, like underneath the rock. I'm sure many of you have seen such a thing. And so the sapling had to grow out kind of like horizontally and all the way around and up and out. And I just remember being like, okay, what is in this being that it knows that if it really exerts itself, eventually, eventually it will find light? How does it know? And, you know, we can think of that energy as like, maybe that's striving, but I really think it's faith, right? Hmm. And so all of this beautiful, these beautiful things are happening. And at the same time, I'm sitting with so much shame because I have to be out in the woods and everybody else is in the meditation hall. Those are all the real meditators over there. They're all calm and serene and like doing their sweet meditation thing. And I have to, the, you know, I have to be outside because I'm like messed up, right? Of course, I have no idea what's going on for people in the hall. They're probably just as messed up as me in different ways. <laughs> but I have this huge narrative at the time that I'm so unredeemably not okay, right? that I'm too traumatized to do this work, that maybe this isn't the path for me. So much doubt, so much shame. And I, I was meeting with my teachers and they were like trying to coach me through letting go of some of the shame. And I just like really did not know how to. And then I looked up, it was early fall and I looked up at the trees and there they were just letting go of leaves, just like that, just letting go. And I'm not saying shame is that easy to let go of. It's definitely not. But just knowing that there were teachers everywhere, there were mentors everywhere throughout the forest, wherever I looked, some being was teaching me something. Some being was nourishing me. Oh, it was really beautiful to learn belonging in the forest. So one day I got really enamored. I mean, I had a lot of time, right? It was many, many, many hours of sitting outside. And so I got really enamored with this one flower and I just decided, cool, I'm gonna sit with this flower all day long and just see what teachings I'm gonna get. And throughout the day, the flower just very, very, very gently would turn towards the sun, you know, like throughout the whole day, it was like this far. And then at night, it's sort of just the, the petals just kind of came in a little bit. And I remember just being so excited and coming to my teacher um, and being like, having tears in my eyes and being like, just, this is wild. Like I didn't know, you know, just, this is so incredible that this happens. And my teacher asked me if I could have even one one hundredth of the reverence that I had for that flower to myself. How would that change me? And how would that change my practice? Because at the time, I just didn't understand that just as flowers open and close, so do I, right? I didn't understand that when I was, I was so wounded and had this big reopening of this wounding of trauma show up. And I was like, expecting myself to be open to it, but actually the brilliance of my body to close, right? The brilliance of my body to shut down and freak out. It's so wise, it's so wise, even though it's very, very challenging, but it's so wise. And then of course, when the conditions were right again, I was closed in the moment, I went home, I felt safer, I opened up again. So we open and we close and we open and we close and that's the nature, of, that's the nature of things, right? And the idea isn't to get hooked into any of these categories, right? It isn't, it isn't to sort of get hooked into now I'm open and that's good and now I'm closed and that's bad, but it's to just watch from over here. Ah, okay, this is how it is. There's opening and there's closing, just like the flower. And when we can watch that for ourselves, we can also watch that for other people, right? So maybe someone who you dearly love is also in this open and closing cycle because we all are, all beings are, right? Open, close, open, close. And then suddenly their annoying behavior is like, maybe not so annoying because, oh, they're just, just like me, they're closing. And now they're opening, you know, I think about how much 
how, how if we're looking carefully, we can see so much interbeing. And we don't have to go on a six week meditation retreat to experience this, right? You can have Sangha with your houseplants. You can notice the ray of sunshine that filters into your basement apartment. And perhaps your amazing cat knows exactly how to lie right in that beam of sunlight, maybe your dog, right? Just so much mentorship around how to take in that nourishment. Cat Sangha, <laughs> pet Sangha. We can turn on the tap of our water and just let it roll on our fingers and just marvel at the miracle of that, right? Because it is, it's quite, it's quite incredible. There's Sangha everywhere. And another place we can hold a mirror of belonging is with ourselves through this practice of meditation, um, which I akin to self-love. And so the Instagram <laughs> gurus will say a lot of things about self-love. Mostly I roll my eyes when I read them um, because usually the vision's just not big enough, right? Like I think of what does it feel like when someone loves me? They're attuned to me, right? I feel like I'm understood by them. I feel acceptance. I feel, yeah, I feel, I just feel like they get me and they're here for me. And they're, they get me in this non-judgmental way, you know? That's what love feels like to me. And like, that's what mindfulness is, right? It's us showing up for ourselves. Difficult things arise, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral things arise, and we just show up. We just show up with it. And that to me is the definition of self-love, is showing up in as much as we can um, for whatever is arising with kindness, right? And, you know, we're, we're not going to be mindful in every moment, but we have the potential to be mindful in every, in every moment. And so I think about that as an opportunity to come home to ourselves in every moment. That opportunity actually exists. There is an opportunity to belong to ourselves in every moment. And I think about what this could mean for the world. You know, this practice is not just for us as individuals. So if, if we think about, you know, like war or even like climate change, which is, you know, a war against the planet. In these kinds of situations, there's often, you know, a good me and a bad other over there. And we have to fight the bad other, right? But if we're doing the work of constantly coming home to ourselves, we, we have this embodied sense that we're pretty okay, we're pretty good. And so then we don't have the same need to make someone else bad in order for us to feel good, for us to be good, sorry. Like, what could that mean for our planet, you know? It's so much bigger than a bubble bath. So I will end with this quote from Bob Sharples. Don't meditate to fix yourself, to heal yourself to improve yourself, to redeem yourself, rather do it as an act of love or deep, warm friendship to yourself. In this way, there is no longer any need for the subtle aggression of self-improvement, for the endless guilt of not doing enough. It offers the possibility of an end to the ceaseless grind of trying so hard that wraps so many people's lives in a knot. Instead, there is now meditation as an act of love. How endlessly delightful and encouraging. We're just taking a moment to take that in before we move into our sit. So we're gonna do a little nature nurturing metta sit. So with metta practice, it's important that you find a posture that feels good for you. So this can be standing, sitting, lying down, walking, anything that feels where there's ease. We are gonna be working with spine energy. 
And so for me, it's helpful to sit because then I can kind of feel into the length of my spine, but you do, you do you. Okay. Um, so, okay, so I live on unceded Coast Salish territories and um, have found a lot of mentorship, belonging, nurturance from the ocean and mountains here. And so we're gonna do a little sit exploring that. Okay, so finding your posture. Turning your attention inwards. You're just noticing the earth, the ground beneath you. Noticing the points of your body that touch that earth element. So perhaps that's your feet, your seat, your thighs. Your back resting on a chair. And seeing if you can allow yourself to be supported by the earth. Letting go into that support. Knowing that you didn't have to do anything in order to receive this support, it's just here. And now imagining that the width of your body is the base of a mountain. So at your hips, at your thighs, and perhaps energetically you need that base to be a bit bigger or a lot bigger. It's great, you can energetically expand that mountain energy, as big as you need it to be. Feeling into the solidity of the base. Depth and width. Noticing how the body feels as it embraces mountain energy. And now that we've created the base, we can get curious about the rest of the mountain, starting with the peak. So the peak can be either at our heads or above our heads. Starting from the base, just gradually make our way up the spine so that the top of our head Somewhere around there is the peak of the mountain. So almost as if there's a little, a little invisible string at the top of your head, you can just kind of pull that up with that upward energy of mountain. Continuing to feel the width at the base. 
and a strong back. Maybe imagining what kind of mountain you might be. Are you covered in flowers? Lots of trees, rocks, snow peak, waterfalls. And so as we feel into that strong base and strong back, can we open our hearts to some softness? So moving our attention to the heart space. Attention either on the sensations in the chest or at the breath in the chest. Right by my house, I have a really perfect view of the mountains and right nestled up against it is the ocean. So we can imagine our heart space to be the water. Just as our breath goes in and out, so too does the gently lapping waves of the water. And we can figure out where we want to be in relationship to the water. Do we want to have our toes just gently touching the cool, refreshing water? Do we want to be way, way, way out on the beach, just kind of looking at a glimmer of blue in the distance? Do we want to go swimming? Swimming, maybe we're floating on our backs, letting the love that is the ocean gently rock us. And maybe it's a warm day. sunshine, and we can feel into the nourishment of that sun, feeling the warmth on our skin, knowing again that we don't have to do anything to deserve the sunshine, it's just here for us. And not the shine, that, that, not the sun shines on every being. And maybe that feels like a lot. It's your image so you can play with it as you wish. Maybe there's some clouds that show up. So the sunlight is not as intense. There's so much love, nurturance, belonging out there, and it's our job to figure out how to receive it, 
that we already belong. Remembering that mountain energy at our base, at our back, if we ever need it. Resting and belonging. May all beings everywhere know the nurturance of the earth. May all beings everywhere be able to receive that love and care of the sunlight, the ocean, the mountains, the earth. May all beings be free. Thanks everyone. We've got 13 minutes to chat about whatever we wanna chat about. So it could be questions, it could be reflections on what showed up for you in practice. Um, yeah, I forgot to say in my intro, I just wanted to name that. I'm doing this as a part of a mentorship project that I am a part of called the True North Insight Mentorship Project. Um, there's some folks here who are part of that as well. And we are all learning how to be community thermal leaders. So um, so yeah, I was mentored by a teacher on the, in this, in this uh, talk. Um, I just wanna name that because it comes from somewhere. I'm not just some random human deciding to do this <laughs> in a program to learn how to do this. <laughs> Great. Does anyone have any questions, thoughts, what showed up for you in either of those meditations? 